Yes, Luca, you can go. Okay. So thank you for the uh, introduction, for the invitation to, to this great conference. So I'm going to give a talk more about a random metric theory talk, really. Um, but a, a problem will arises in the study of, of random neural networks. So it's based on a couple of works, one uh, about a couple of years ago and one which is ongoing with, with Sandrine Péchet. Uh, and so let me um, kind of give you the model and, and what I'm going to study. So here what I'm going to neural network, I mean, you know, maybe uh, we know from all the talk we saw yesterday, um, you know, X going to be an input vector and actually later an input matrix. Okay, if you take for several samples of, the, of this data and W will be a certain matrix uh, of weight. And then you have this nonlinearity of n two wise to this vector or this matrix later uh, by the activation function. Okay, and so here I give some example of activation function that people use. Um, it'll be a motivation to do a simulation with these uh, uh, with this activation function. So the, the signaloid or the absolute value, or also something used with the rectified in a unit, which is the max of zero x. And um, and that's uh, the model I'm going to study is based on that. So here I do like several layers. I'm actually going to focus on the singular case. Uh, but we still have some result on, on multiple layers. So uh, the you know as I said, I work in random metrics theory. So often to to try to understand very complicated systems, uh, one good way is to make things random. Okay, so you can uh, maybe take the random weights, random data, and, and see what's happening on different statistics. Of course, random neural networks are used. You know, for initialization, you can take uh, random weights, for instance, and, and things like this. So um, where do random metrics theory come comes into place, and where? Um, you know, eigenvalues and uh, maybe eigenvectors also arises um, is by the following. So here now X is an input data matrix. So see, uh, I did some more dimension uh, to, to the data. And let's say A is an output target data sets. And the point of the training phase is to find the best output weights after one layer of the network. So here W will be random. So let's say random weight matrix by AD entries. And let's do ridge regression. So let's try to minimize this loss function here. Um, so of course you want the uh, output um, you know, to look like the target data sets, and you have the regularization factor, which you know, to avoid overfitting. And you can just solve this, this, this thing by the what's called the ridge regressor, and you have this formula here. So of course, it depends on the target data sets, it depends on, on, on y, which is f of wx, and on this factor here. And, and one interesting thing, especially uh, in random metric theory, that this matrix here is a very particular one, if you know a bit of operator theory, is just the resolvent, okay, pi that minus gamma, uh, of this sample covariance matrix uh, y transpose y. Okay. And then you can even look at different statistics at like the expected loss of those function uh, depending on the weight or the random data, etc. And you can see that the eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors arises in this type of problems because of course the resolvent um, you know contains information on eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, on y transpose y. Okay, it's a, sym it's a symmetric matrix. So you know you have array eigenvalues and orthogonal eigenvectors and, and you can reconstruct this. Okay, so that's kind of the training phase will depend possibly on the spectral measure. And that's where the interest on, on this field of, of looking at this type of matrices comes from. Okay, this type of problem. So uh, the model I'm going to consider here is the following. So uh, here I took a low assumption, but I'm going to go pretty quick about them. I'm going to take W and X random. Okay, so of course you could ask whether, you know, for application it's useful or not to take the data random. Um, but here on a more theoretical level, so some interesting things have happened when you take both W and X to be random. I'm going to take them independent centered also symmetric, so the third moment will be zero. Um, whether it's it really important or not is, is a question. Um, and I'm going to scale them variance one, but it doesn't really matter. And they're going to have a sub-exponential decay. Okay, so for instance, you can take Bernoulli works or Gaussian or um, yeah, exponential. I mean, many things work, but we want symmetric though. Uniform, I guess, works. Um, and that's different things. So the activation function has something very strong, which is real analytics. It's used in the proof for a polynomial approximation. For application, it's not completely, you know, out of it. Of course, I should get absolute value. I should do the real U, which are not analytic, but they have an analytic counterpart, okay, like the soft plus or things like this. And I'm going to um, add an assumption. It'll be later for the second part of the talk, which is that I'm going to center the function. Okay, so I'm going to take a function. So the expectation of f of a Gaussian is zero. Of course, it doesn't matter too much. It's just setting a rank one perturbation to your uh, to your matrix, but this matter to not have a trivial huge eigenvalue somewhere. Basically, it's like a nice center. And you know it's called youth in high dimensions. I'm going to use a limit uh, of dimension, and uh, I'm going to work in this random matrix regime when all dimension grows together. Okay, phi m psi are two parameters uh, depending on w, x, and different sizes. Okay, and so the the matrix I'm going to consider is the simple covariance matrix y y transpose, where y is f of w x over square root n zero. So here's just to scale to have something of order one, uh, and I'm going to uh, to look at this matrix here. 
Okay, so the eigenvalues, and in particular, I'm going to first look at the EED, as uh, so the empirical eigenvalue distribution, uh, which is going to give us you know, information on the whole kind of macroscopic behavior of eigenvalues. So uh, what is the first theorem is the following, is that actually there is a, at the limit, a deterministic probability distribution mu f uh, for the EED. Okay, and uh, we can describe it by what's called a quartic self constituted equation for a stress transform. So maybe you don't know what that means and it doesn't really matter. Uh, what can matter is that um, it's more complicated than the usual one. Like the Wigner semicircle would be a quadratic or Machenko pasture will be quadratic. Here is something a bit more complicated because as we before, okay, and it depends on F I M psi, but it doesn't depend on distribution of W and X. Okay, so it's a universal eigenvalue distribution. Uh, and so this type of problem has been studied actually quite a lot recently. So uh, the first two papers looking at this in a way was paying Tanwara and Luar Yaokuye, then Luar Kuye for different assumption, most likely things are Gaussian or kind of functional of Gaussian, something like this. Uh, last year, Fan and Wang, uh, I think Cho's going to give a talk uh, later this week, he looked at a similar problem with ID Gaussian for multiple layers also uh, with a nice result. And, and also very recently, Pico and Shorter looked at this problem again by using a different method, uh, which is a bit more robust, the resolvent method that we use. Okay. So, uh, Okay, so let's do some, you know, what does the eigenvalue look like? So it looks like this. So here I take the sigmoid, so hyperbolic tangent, um, the ReLU and the absolute value. So I took a different um, activation function and look at the EED. So, okay, maybe you, you just different EEDs. Something interesting happening for this one, if you look very closely, is that it's actually um, the marching go pasture distribution. Okay, so it's kind of interesting that if you take Wx and you take the absolute value of every entry and you look at the sample covariance matrix, you recover the marching capacity distribution. Okay. And actually, it's not just the absolute value. So you can find a wild class of function that took even more complicated at the end to show that you still get marching capacity. Um, here, I take an odd function, x minus 3x, plus sign, log absolute value, and they all get the marching capacity distribution of a certain parameter phi of epsilon. Okay. Um, and so why is that? It's for the following. So that's the... the the limiting measure. So, I'm, you know, that's a big equation, but don't, you know, don't look at it too much. It's not that important. What's very important is the first line um, is that it depends on two parameters uh, only of the, of the function. So on expectation of F of a Gaussian squared. Okay? So of course it can be zero. It can't be zero except if F is zero. And theta two, the expectation of F prime of a Gaussian squared, but the square is outside of the expectation. Okay? So in particular, this can be zero. And um, I wrote it like this because there's something interesting happening. There are two special cases. You have if theta one equals theta two, then of course this term just vanish. And then you have a cubic equation. And this is not surprising because the only function for which theta one can be equal to theta two are linear functions. Okay, you can just like Stein's lemma basically. I think. Um, you, you, you recover um, only linear functions. So of course the, your model is just a linear one. And so you recover the product B sharp. Okay. So uh, linear neural network like yesterday. And you recover just this matrix. And another special case is if theta two equals zero, then this term vanishes, and then you recover a quadratic equation and you recover the Marchenko pasture distribution. So actually, you have a whole class of function where theta two equals zero uh, that makes you recover the Marchenko pasture distribution. And actually, the interesting behavior is that uh, that we have a result for. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it for, for time reason, but if you look at several layers, so if you keep putting IID weights. And you keep you choose your function to be marching capacitor at the start, you're going to recover marching capacitor at every layer okay, if you normalize correctly each time. Um, so it's an interesting uh, behavior. And actually, the, the Fan Wang paper kind of states exactly what happened for multiple layers for any activation function. So, um, so that's that. So, even though I told you to not look at this equation, you can look at actually this model of random matrix theory. So, actually, the eigenvalue distribution is similar to the same, the asymptotic one, as a, as a linear model. And actually, it's an interpolation between the product V-chart and Marchenko pasteur So it's really like two extremal cases. And depending if you have a function which is not one of those, you have an interpolation between the two. You have a product V-chart and, and a full IID matrix of correct dimension. And you just have, have the two. Okay, so if you want to do that two, this one is 0. And theta 2 equals 0, you just have this thing to be 0. OK? So that's the, the behavior for the, the eigenvalue, the empirical eigenvalue distribution to the whole you know, thing of eigenvalues, and we saw it was used for the ridge regression here. But um, but it doesn't tell us anything about another interesting random metric theoretical problem, which is the behavior of the largest eigenvalue. Okay, of course, if you know the asymptotic EED, you don't know anything about individual eigenvalues. Okay, you just know that you know the whole thing looks like this, but you don't know about you know the first or second or third one even eigenvalues. Uh, and so the, the we're going to look at this now. 
So the Lorentz eigenvalue uh, is as you can't really see it maybe directly by looking at a solution of a retrogression or something like this. But there's some numerical evidence uh, in this paper that I said earlier that shows that maybe the, the existence of not an outlier, so it means a, an eigenvalue that pops out of the bulk, could, could help um, having an idea of the testing error. And, and they made this observation for a certain, I think, classification problem that the existence of an outlier and the distance of the outlier from the bulk gives you a, a better testing error. So the idea is that if you don't have any outlier, you actually they can't even classify correctly. And if you have one which is further and further from the bulk, you get a better and better testing error. Okay, so uh, this motivates the, the at least the study of this larger second value, uh, which is uh, actually we'll see a pretty non-trivial. Okay, there's some uh, interesting things uh, happen very different than the uh, empirical eigenvalue distribution. So I'm going to look at three uh, different, um, let's say, behaviors or three different um, you know, ways to, to, to change the parameters and see how it impacts the, the large second value. So the first one I'm going to call non-universality uh, is the following. So I'm going to fix an activation function f, which here I just take x squared minus 1 over square root 2, and just for, for, for simplicity. So it's centered so that you know I told you I don't have any huge eigenvalue anywhere. Um, square root 2 is just so theta 1 equal 1. Okay, It doesn't really matter. And theta 2 equals 0. I'd fix phi m psi to be this one, and I take x to be a Bernoulli. So when I mean Bernoulli, I mean minus one one, probability one half one half. Okay, so the simplest distribution you can take. And I'm going to change the distribution of w. Okay, so if I take w to also be Bernoulli, of course I get Marchenko Pasteur because I have theta two equals zero. Okay, so I know I should get Marchenko Pasteur, um, and I don't get any outlier. Now I can take something with a bit of a heavier tail. I take w to be a quarter of the time uh, Bernoulli and three quarter of the time Gaussian. Okay, so now I have a you know, a force moment which is a bit higher if you want. Uh, and I start to see something happening, which is I get one outlier. And then I can take something with a bit heavier tail, which is just Gaussian. And now I get still an outlier, but even further away. So here was two, and here is like 2.2 .2 or something like this. And you can see that the heavier kind of you get the, 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 the tail of the distribution is, the further from the bulk you get this outlier. So um, this is a behavior which is really interesting and very, in a way, nonlinear. Uh, what I mean by this is that if you look uh, at the study of outliers in, for linear models in one number six theory, the position of the outlier is usually universal, okay? um, which means that the existence and the position is universal, and the fluctuations sometimes are non-universal. Uh, but here it's very different because just the existence or the position uh, is non-universal because it really depends on the on the distribution of W and X. Well, X it's fixed by here W. Okay, so this observation was made in this paper, I said it before, Luan Yaukuye, though they couldn't really um, explain you know, mathematically why you have a, an outlier here. So the, uh, the second interesting behavior will be the following, will be about um, the architecture of the model. So what I mean by architecture, of course, is a single layer model, so not the number of layers, but the different dimension, if I am size, so number of samples or N0, etc. So here I'm going to still fix uh, this activation function, I'm going to fix W and X with a certain distribution. And I'm going to change phi M psi. Okay, so of course, the, the shape will change okay, because um, I will again marching capacitor with shape phi over psi. Uh, but the most interesting thing will be about the larger second value. So here for this phi M psi, I don't get any outlier. Uh, now I get the phi M psi is slightly different. So phi over psi will get lower, I think. Uh, and I get one outlier. And if I do it again, now I get two outliers. Okay, so I get something uh, still, again, very different. And you want to understand these two outliers as one for x and one for w. That's the idea. And we'll see at, at the end why, why is that. So that's, uh, that's this, uh, this problem where they, the, the architecture, in a way, in the, the way the dimension kind of behaves together, also can change the, the existence of another outlier. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about the activation function and how um, a different choice of activation function can also um, make a rise as a, 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 an outlier or not. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take a certain activation function. So it looks very complicated. Uh, actually, it's not really just cosine of alpha x, really. Um, but it is centered and scaled so that theta 1 is always equal to 1. Okay? So theta 1 is equal to 1, whatever I take alpha to be. And uh, theta 2 will always be 0 because this is an even function. So I still get much in capacitor. Um, but the two parameters are fixed. So in particular, the ED will never change, okay? the asymptotic ED, because it depends only on these two parameters, and they are fixed. I'm going to fix phi m psi also, and I'm going to fix the distribution of W and X also. Okay? So everything is fixed, so the ED will be the same, and 
you know, whether or not the outlier arises means that something different is happening to the activation function. And actually it is. So here I take alpha equal two, I get marching capacitor and now outlier. But if I take alpha 1.5, I start to see one outlier coming up. And then if I take alpha equal 0.8, even smaller, I start to see two outliers. Okay, so really um, it means that the behavior of this large second value depends on a different way uh, of the activation function than just the EED. Okay, if you want to have to go maybe one order later to understand um, what's happening uh, for these outliers. And so uh, actually, so all of that observation will, will be given in the theorem, uh, but I wanted to maybe show you know, what's happening because maybe it's less clear by just reading these phrases um, that, that something different is happening. So, uh, so yes, it depends on another parameters, which I call theta three here, which is now the uh, expectation of F second of the Gaussian. Okay, so um, whether or not you have an outlier in the, in the position of the outlier depends on F second of a Gaussian and not just uh, F prime of, of F. Um, here I'm going to define kappa actually for a later remark. So um, here's a kurtosis. The kurtosis is the fourth moment divided by the variance squared. Uh, and it will depend also on that, so on the fourth moment in particular. And so what is the, the theorem? Is that actually the behavior of the R second value also relates to a linear model, um, but uh, which depends on which is distribution dependent on W and X. So what I mean by that is there exists a rank two random matrix J hat. And this J hat is a bit I mean, not really complicated, but a bit big to write, but it depends on W and X. Okay? So it depends on the distribution of W and on the distribution of X. If you want, you have one rank for W and one rank for, for X in a way. Um, it depends also on N0, okay? it's hidden inside the matrix. Uh, so they depend on phi and psi, uh, but it doesn't depend on the function. Okay, the really only theta three will be the depends on the function, uh, not on J hat. And um, you have uh, the, the largest second value of M is the same as the sample coherence matrix uh, given by this matrix. You have the same linear model that we saw earlier. Okay, so we know that ED is given by this, uh, but the largest second value is given by a perturbation of this uh, linear model by a rank two random matrix J hat um, given by uh, this coefficient theta three and the distribution of W and X. Okay, so uh, here, the existence or not of outliers is what's called the BBP phase transition. So it's something in random matrix theory that exists, which states basically that maybe if the perturbation is big enough, so if theta three is big enough, if the fourth moment of W and X are big enough, if the phi over psi is big, or low enough or big enough, then you get uh, one or two outliers. Okay, and that's a, a theory that's pretty well known in the linear case, um, either using a one moment method or also a, a, like subordination and free probability, uh, something which is pretty well understood. So uh, there's some several um, cases I want to, to consider. So if theta two equals zero, which is an example I showed you in the simulation, you get marching capacitor. And actually in this case, you can have something a bit more simple, which is uh, actually to, for the largest eigenvalue, you have a rank one perturbation. Uh, J and one hem is just a matrix full of ones. Okay. Um, and it depends only on the on F second and on the kurtosis of the of the distribution. So on the fourth moment. So the, the largest the fourth moment is, the further away from the bolt you are, and the the bigger uh, theta three is also the further you are from the from the bulk. Okay, so here it's a bit more simple. And actually here the position and the existence of an of an outlier is completely explicit. Okay, like work one perturbation of full IID matrices are very well understood now uh, since you know, 2005 or four with the first case of the VP phase transition. And there's been many, many work to understand this. And so you can even have a formula for the position of the outlier in this case for W and X random. Uh, another observation is that if theta three equals zero, then of course there's no perturbation. And so you don't have any outliers. Okay? So that's uh, one reason. For example, if your function is odd, uh, you don't have any, uh, any, uh, any outliers. And also, um, it's the way J hat look, which I'm not showing here, but if W and X are um, Bernoulli, so minus one, one with probability one half, one half, then J hat is zero also. Okay. Um, so you can see it directly here, but you see it in this formula because kappa, which is the kurtosis of W and X will be zero, okay? Because Bernoulli uh, is the only uh, distribution that have kurtosis one, okay? So kappa will always be zero for this, uh, for this distribution. So that's an observation that was made also in this paper by Luario Kuye that if you take Bernoulli weights, uh, you don't get any outliers. And that's kind of a, the, the idea why. Um, so uh, finally, the two little remarks I want to make is that here it's a rank two random matrix. So usually a rank two means that you have possible two outliers. Okay? And it seems to be true, right? You have sometimes two outliers. 
Um, and we believe that the results should be true. Okay, that if you look at this model and you look at the possible two outliers, they, they look similar to the two outliers uh, here, sorry, here. Um, however, the proof uh, is uh, not as robust as this, and we can only consider the largest second value. And, and on the second one, but it should be the same idea uh, that, that this gives the two outliers. And so finally, uh, I want to finish by saying one thing is that this is not completely surprising, even though uh, it's very nonlinear in the sense that it behaves very different than, linear, um, than usual linear models. Um, uh, there's a paper from 2015 by Fallon Montanari who looked at the similar problem for, the, for kernel matrices, so f of xx transpose instead of uh, f of wx, f of wx transpose. And, and they have actually similar um, idea and similar result where it depends on, on the same theta 3 and also on the fourth moment um, in a similar way. So of course, we only one outlier. You have one symmetrized outlier, um, but uh, you get something similar. Uh, and actually, I want to thank Chofan particularly. Actually, we talked about, about this, and he instigated this problem, really, uh, of looking at the large second value. Um, and, uh, and this is slightly different because you have, in a way, two randomness. You have W and X to be random. So that's one way where you have two outliers, right? Okay, so I think my time is up, and I want to thank you for your, for your attention.